Good afternoon. Welcome to Grand Rounds today. Uh, please remember to fill out the attendance record and also please remember to fill out the program evaluation and uh, I will ask you uh, to consider giving us any ideas that you might have in regards to future topics uh, and future speakers. Uh, today I have uh, the pleasure of introducing Dr. Stephen Elliott. Dr. Elliott uh, gave us an, an ex extremely good grand round several months ago and uh, we've invited him back again today. Uh, Dr. Elliott is a, a, a pediatrician and a pediatric hematologist oncologist. He did his uh, training in pediatrics and pediatric hematology oncology at the Mayo Clinic and currently he's on the staff at Blank uh, where he directs the uh, out, uh, the pediatric uh, cl uh, clinic. Uh, he also is associate clinical professor of medicine at the University of Iowa and uh, he's here to provide us with some pediatric pearls. The topic of his talk is under the radar. Um, please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Elliott. I hope it's on now. I want to tell you, I have friends who live in the area, and they love coming to the McFarland Clinic, so I hope my patients love it as much coming to our clinic as they like coming here. But I like to present, I have friends who collect rocks and stamps and you name it, and I like to collect interesting medical information. And I work in a really nice tertiary care children's hospital, Blank, the oldest and biggest children's hospital in Iowa. And since I like so much, now I run a diagnostic clinic. And these are some of the cases we had which I find very educational. And so I hope when you leave, if you didn't learn one thing, I'm going to give you your money back, okay? <laughs> but it's just called under the radar. And so some of the kind of things that, that I've learned uh, in the years at, at Blank and running a diagnostic clinic. It's really hard when you have simple things walk into your office and they're simple to treat and you have complex things that are standard, they have a normal presentation. But I'm going to, the first case I'm going to present is something that happens to all of us in medicine sooner or later. You have a rather rare presentation of a rare disease to begin with and how difficult it is sometimes to make a, a unifying diagnosis. Yeah. <clears throat> this is a four-year-old female who actually before we saw it had been seen locally at least for three months since she had a variety of pains, but her primary problem was she had a left wrist swollen and tender. And I mean, if you tried to touch her wrist, she would just scream in pain. Uh, the thing, we use ANAs in, in pediatrics, I'm sorry, we use running ANAs in pediatrics very much like the adults do rheumatoid factor, et cetera. She had a very positive ANA, her hemoglobin was low, her platelet count was uh, slightly elevated but she had an elevated set rate in the 50s or 60s. It's pretty easy then to say, well, you know, everything on her exam and everything about her laboratory work was consistent with having juvenile inflammatory arthritis. It's really hard for me as an older person, we called it JRA for so many years, and now they like to use juvenile inflammatory arthritis. Most of the standard treatment now, it, you can either start with one to two things. If it's a single joint, a lot of now pediatricians and pediatric rheumatologists will do this joint uh, actually steroid in, uh, injections. This child was brought on naproxen and it took her an extremely long time to get better. That should have been our very first clue. Typically, if you get on high dose uh, naproxen twice a day, we see the children get relatively well very quickly. This girl took about three months to her pain completely went away and she was feeling better. All the time she had multiple blood counts, we consider naproxen to be a high-risk medication, so her CBC was still normal. And it'd be nice if we could end the story there and say she was, did fine, but within another three months, she was back to being even worse than she was initially. She was in pain, her CBC was again normal, she'd already been to rheumatology. We have a wonderful pediatric rheumatologist at the University of Iowa, uh, Polly Ferguson. She agreed on the diagnosis and the plan and thought everything would be okay. <clears throat> However, when she wasn't okay, uh, she said, well, maybe we ought to move ahead and look for something else other than... So she had a bone scan, and it was interesting. It was the only positive part of the bone scan was still her left wrist, which was now six months ago when she started with the pain. We did an MRI of her wrist. When I was very proud of some very smart young radiologist. said, listen, that MRI shows she has marrow infiltration in that wrist. Marrow infiltration, I said, that's really wonderful since, you know, what's a di differential diagnosis if you have marrow infiltration? He said, well, it's either leukemia or lymphoma. I said, hmm, as a pediatric hematologist oncologist, I've seen lots of different presentations of leukemia, but no one like this. And certainly enough, uh, her blood count stayed normal to the end. Her bone marrow was absolutely packed. It shows you in pediatrics she had acute lymphocytic leukemia uh, with this unusual presentation. What we've argued about for months in our clinic and among the various pediatric hematologists and oncologists said, did she really have JIA in the beginning? 
or does she just really have smoldering ALL from the beginning? As you know, when you start therapy for ALL, you get high-dose steroids, so if she certainly had a, an inflammatory arthritis, she was going to have enough treatment. But I think it's very interesting to see someone now who's six to seven months in their illness, the blood counts were normal every time, the blood counts were normal the day she had her bone marrow and her bone marrow was packed. So I think sometimes when you get a rare disease with a rare presentation, uh, you can really be stuck in medicine. What's nice about ALL, I just want to say one thing, the new statistics just came out this last month, and over 90% of children with a new diagnosis of ALL now, the five-year survival rate is above 90%, and that's hard to beat, yeah? The next one's a little interesting thing because we, used, we forgot about measles, and I want to tell you when I... When I, I lecture to our residents, I try to go over many, many infectious diseases. For years, we didn't have to talk about measles because measles wasn't around. We didn't even worry about measles. However, it, it might be gone, or we thought it was gone, but it's not forgotten because now we're back to having measles occur on a very regular epidemic in America. And it's certainly based all on one thing. We have a lot of people now come not only to central Iowa, but all over the country who last week or la yesterday was in Burma or someplace in Africa. They got on the plane and came here, uh, unfortunately smoldering with measles. So it wasn't 2011, it had 17 measles outbreaks, 222 cases of a disease that we had rarely seen before. But I think it's very important to point out that most of these were imported cases, okay? Of these, 166 were unvaccinated. Even though 85% were eligible, the ones that weren't eligible were just too early to get the vaccine at a recommended age. So what's the purpose of all that? Well, I think the purpose of all, I'm really into vaccination. I don't want to go back to the good old days as a pediatrician when I watch children die from Malthus influenza B, uh, cellulitis or epiglottitis or meningitis and be maimed uh, from all the other vaccine preventable diseases and especially measles. But it's a very strange world we live in. We tell people, wear your helmet. You know, it's really important you wear your bike helmet. Wear sunscreen. In Iowa, you get a ticket, you get a nice fine if you don't wear a seatbelt. But it's okay not to vaccinate your children. I do not understand how you can put wear your seat belts or your fine together with any kind of thought process, but don't vaccinate them. Let them get some vaccine-preventable disease to be die from it or be maimed. But that's just my, my feeling about it. <laughs> this is nice. I just want to point out for measles, since it can walk into your ER or your clinic. One thing, remember, that's really important about measles, you're almost always going to have coryza. Uh, you're going to have photophobia. If you don't have a cough, you probably don't have measles. Uh, and then you're going to start with this a nice rash. And this middle form rash, macular papular rash, always starts on the head and upper trunk and goes downwards. But it's a really classic case of measles. I think what's very interesting, I just got my American Academy of Pediatrics thing this week, and what they talk about imported measles. So I thought it was very timely just to remind people the measles is back. If you've got an unvaccinated child, or which becomes more and more common, you're just really asking for problems in your clinic. Uh, Dr. Offutt, who speaks on vaccination, he's really, really pro-vaccine to try to eliminate some of the movie stars who are anti-vaccine, talks about eight cases now in pediatrics where the doctor and the clinic's been sued by having unvaccinated people come to their clinic. Four of them, the doctor didn't explain the horrors of all the diseases, and the other four, they were there and gave the patients in the clinic measles or H. haemophilus influenza B. So you've got to be really careful. When you have unvaccinated people around you now, you're really at medical risk. I also like to really emphasize HPV vaccination. It's probably, when you look at the statistics that come out every, every month in the morbidity and mortality report, HPV vaccine is the least acceptable vaccine with the lowest rate of any probably vaccine around that we have now. And we have all kinds of things. I talk to a lot of parents from my, my friends and family practice and my friends in pediatrics, try to convince them. And, and, and they can, they can, I hear every week one time, oh, I'm not going to give my daughter HPV vaccination. She's going to be a virgin when she gets married, and why would she want to worry about having HPV? That's too bad if her, if her husband-to-be has had 20 partners in the past. <laughs> uh, and again, so why do you also want to, do, why do you want to immunize males? And so I want to kind of go over why you want to immunize males in our new area of sexuality, okay? Just remember now that you don't have to think about having HPV and having cervical carcinoma. In the last five years, the unbelievable increase in penile, rectal, and oral pharyngeal carcinoma, it was shown to be HPV associated by finding the same uh, uh, antigens there again. No question of HPV associated, and people tend to forget about that and think, oh, you know, males don't get it. Well, not only do males get it, but right now, about half the cases of HPV-associated cancers, 
are in males. By far still in females, since last year, 21,000 cases in female, 12,000 cases in males. So again, in females, we think about cervical carcinomas, and males, you really have to think about oral pharyngeal carcinomas. And not only that, they don't, still don't have the true reasons, but that in all the cases, males are probably four times likely than females to get HPV-associated carcinomas in the oral pharyngeal area. So I just want to say, if people say they don't want to have this vaccine, I also think that they, they need to really look at the statistics. No female wants to get carcinoma associated with HPV vaccination. No male should want to get HPV vaccinated, get a carcinoma associated with being unimmunized. It's a nice, easy vaccine. Yeah. I also like to talk about what's happened in, in, in pediatrics as far as pharyngitis is concerned. And I didn't think I'd be interested in pharyngitis to sometimes things that happen. And, this is, I know this is the story in quite detail. This is my oldest grandson. His name is John, and he's a junior in, in Xavier High School in Cedar Rapids. And a few weeks ago, he got really ill and lethargic. Uh, and he went to, a, first of all, he went to a walk-in clinic. And they said, oh, we don't know what you have, but we're going to give you azithromycin, a Z-pack. And so my, my son-in-law, who's a urologist there, called me and said, they put him on a Z-Pack, and my daughter is going to yell at me when I say, yeah, we did. I said, yeah, I'm going to yell at you. Why? You don't know what he has. Why do you want to put him on a Z-Pack for? Well, it didn't work. His exudative tonsillitis got worse. He got really swollen anterior cervical lymph nodes. He didn't have any cough or pulmonary symptoms. and didn't have splenomegaly. Yeah. So what he did have was a new kind of organism that's very common in adolescents and young adults who have pharyngitis. That's called fusobacterium. Fusobacterium has really, really become an important pathogen. No one has any explanation pathophysiologically why it doesn't affect younger children and why when you get past 25, it's a very rare condition. In this group from about 12 to 25, now in the early studies, this is a study from England where the people came in with pharyngitis this age group. 11% had group A strep, 10% had fusobacterium, 2% group G strep, and 1% group C. So it's become really an associated pattern. There's been two relatively large studies in America involving at least 400 patients each one that shows the same thing. The last one in America was 12% group A strep, 12% fusobacterium. But you really kind of know that you want to really treat fusobacterium because you can have a long-term Lemaire syndrome and have really significant problems with untreated fusobacterium. So the new ID recommendations in pediatrics and adolescent medicine is that you treat if the strep is negative, they walk in and you know their strep is negative almost every time the symptoms mimic having mononucleosis and the monoscreen, or, uh, the EBV antibodies are negative. Then they say if you have three of the following, fever, exudative tonsillitis, cervical adenopathy, tender, and lack of cough, they suggest they should be treated. I'm really not aggressive in giving antibiotics. I think there's needs, and we try to prevent overuse of antibiotics. But this is really interesting to remember that infusobacterium is a cause of pharyngitis in this specific age group. And again, I think it's, it's very important, especially down at the bottom, you're not sensitive to macrolides. Uh, you need penicillin or cephalosporins. And why give anything other than penicillin? Because they're all sensitive, just like group A strep to penicillin. I also now at the diagnostic clinic, we see on a regular basis children with rheumatological type symptoms. And since there's not a pediatric rheumatologist in Des Moines, we see them, but we never see them and presume we're rheumatologists. We talk to Dr. Ferguson in Iowa City, the pediatric rheumatologist, and we go over everything with her on every case. But I just want you to remember this is the last this is the interesting one we just had recently a 10 year old female. She was previously absolutely healthy, no problems in her whole life. She didn't even like doctors. Uh, she began a fever, no fever, no rash, no anything, and said her right knee hurt. Uh, she hadn't traveled. We weren't worried about having her Lyme disease or any long-term, no, no medicines, no anything. And she certainly had a swollen, tender right knee, uh, which we couldn't explain. But her basic worked up to negative. Remember, we use ANA in pediatric rheumatology as a, as a normal treatment. Most children who have any inflammatory arthritis in children, the biggest marker is still ANA. Rheumatoid factor was negative, which is very, very rarely positive in children anyway. Her Lyme titers were negative. Her sed rate was slightly high. What's interesting about her is she had very little response to anti-inflammatory therapy. We normally put the children on naproxen. Remember, there's no difference between naproxen and ibuprofen other than you only have to give naproxen twice a day instead of three or four times. Later on, her wrist became sore. So after we didn't have any answer the first try, we go back into a second uh, set of tears, and she had a very high antibody type of the parvovirus. I want you to know if you learn nothing else today, 
parvovirus gets around. Parvovirus is a significant pathogen, both for children and adults. Yeah? The, for, if people who think about parvovirus think only about fifth disease, we just have this nice slap tick appearance and a reticular rash on your body, then you're really missing parvovirus. I think there's many interesting studies out now about the rheumatological effect, especially in adults. Actually, the very first large study came from the University of Iowa, where about 8% of the people who initially presented to the rheumatology clinic there, the adult rheumatology clinic, were shown to have evidence of recent parvovirus infection. The other thing that's very interesting in females, the nice thing about having parvovirus-induced inflammatory arthritis is it's usually transient. But not only does parvovirus then cause a variety of immunological disorders, especially in children and adults, it also gets around. As a pediatric hematologist oncologist, our biggest fear in the whole world was our patients who had, who had sickle cell disease, had hereditary spherocytosis, anything with a shortened life red cell span. When they got parvovirus, you and I as red cells live 120 days. So if you shut off your marrow for 10 days, you might go from 15 grams to 14 grams and no one cares. If your hemoglobin is 7 and your life, red cell lifespan is 20 days and you cut it in half, there are severe transient aplastic crises from, from having parvovirus infection. The other big thing that is now becoming more and more in our literature is having an infection with parvovirus in your first trimester, trimester of pregnancy. It's a teratogen. There's no question about it, all the many, many studies now. You can have fetal loss or you can have all kinds of fetal teratogenic effects. So if you just think now, Who's going to be exposed to parvovirus? We have many young females who are teachers who then get exposed to parvovirus infection on a regular basis. We have many of them who are daycare workers or nurses. So the worst thing in the world is to have a parvovirus during your first trimester because of all the known effects. It's been known to cause myocarditis. The other thing it does in our immunocompetent children and adults, it causes pancytopenias. They don't really know since a primary parvovirus tends to have its primary duplication and erythroblasts, but how it becomes pancytopenia is no one has an answer for. So I just want you to remember, uh, they, they get around. Uh, it's not parvovirus, it doesn't cause having fifth disease. The other thing I'd like to point out is that we get questions all the time, infectious disease, hematology. Remember, once you have the, the slap cheek appearance and you have the rash and you have parvovirus, uh, a fifth disease, you're no longer infective. You can go back to school, you're not going to infect anyone. It's just that the week before, when you didn't have any symptoms, when you spread the disease. So it's really hard to stop something when you don't even know you have the disease not to go to school or not to go to daycare. The reservoir is still human to human. There is no other way you're probably going to get parvovirus. Remember, dogs get parvovirus. They don't think this dog strains of parvovirus are the ones that affect humans. In fact, no studies ever shown that for a fact. Many, many people believe that. But most people in ID show when you go back and do specific typing that the dogs have a different parvovirus than the humans do. Yeah? That's a very good question. I'm also really big now because we see on a regular basis what's called post-streptococcal reactive arthritis. Uh, again, just remember that we've known for a long time, especially with other gram negatives, Yersinia and other related, even Salmonella, you can get the infection, you get better, and all of a sudden you get this reactive arthritis. It was only until recently we, we put the same thing together of having streptococcal infections, group A, uh, beta hemolytic strep of the throat. Yeah. It wasn't even used in 1959. Uh, and again, they had a great initial trouble deciding what is post-streptococcal reactive arthritis and how is it different than having rheumatic fever? To this day, most people say, now you can be normal. Probably there's this large group in the middle called post-streptococcal reactive arthritis, and then you have rheumatic fever. It becomes very hard sometimes to separate where you are in that continuum. But again, when they tried to compare post-streptococcal reactive arthritis to rheumatic fever initially, they found several things. First of all, the rheumatic fever tended to occur much later after a group A strep infection than post-streptococcal reactive arthritis, 10 as opposed to 14 to 21 days. Again, if you have rheumatic fever, I can tell you one thing. The very first day you put them on aspirin or ibuprofen as an anti-inflammatory, 
It's like a miracle. The next day they call and say, all my joint pains are better or gone, okay? If you have post-epticoccal reactive arthritis and I put you on ibuprofen or naproxen or aspirin, it takes you a long time to get better, if you get better, yeah? So again, in rheumatic fever, the arthritis, uh, we, have to, we teach our residents and students and that it's migratory and transient and it not only involves large joints. If you have post-epticoccal reactive arthritis, it can stay in one joint, it can be severe and even affect small joints. So there's quite a difference, yeah? Again, it's using consistency. Now they're trying to put these all together in mega studies showing what it is, okay? It's still down to bottom line, I want to point out. It's very hard sometimes to say, do you have rheumatic fever or do you have post epicoccal reactive arthritis? And I'm going to show you the newest studies that put this all together is probably how you can do it, yeah? If you read the American Heart Association, you know, if you get rheumatic fever, they want you to be on penicillin prophylaxis for life. They now recommend if you have post-epticoccal reactive arthritis, you be on penicillin for a year. Is there evidence for this? No. Uh, they just feel if you've already had missed strep infections, it's probably not good to miss anymore. Again, this is the largest study now that really cleared up the pediatric literature as far as post-epticoccal reactive arthritis. This is a very large study from Israel where they actually, if you had 150, if you had 159 cases of rheumatic fever and 68 cases of, of, of having post-epticoccal reactive arthritis, you had a lot of cases. It takes a long time uh, to find this in America, except right now, again, there's a rheumatic fever that evolved, evolved in, the, in the western states, in Utah, Colorado right now, uh, for some reason it's been gone for years, rheumatic fever is back, so you can't really predict rheumatic fever. But this really showed us the four variables that can probably separate them very nicely, yeah? That the SED rate typically be, is typically much higher if you have acute rheumatic fever, 92 versus 5.7, the same thing for a C-reactive protein, 10 versus 2. A responsive therapy, again, what we talked about before, yeah, if you have acute rheumatic fever, your response to anti-inflammatory therapy is rapid and almost always 100%. It took a long time to have any kind of comfort from the joints. If you had post epicoccal reactive arthritis, and almost never did you completely get rid of it. Then again, it's very nice in the acute rheumatic fever, the relapse rate was only 7%. Once you stopped anti-inflammatory, it was not uncommon at all, 21% to have joint pain and symptomatology again. Again, what's nice about this study is from there that none of them, they called acute uh, post epicoccal reactive arthritis, went on to get rheumatic fever, and I think probably get carditis, and I think that's a really, really important differentiation. That's the reason we worry about rheumatic fever, yeah? I don't think we need that one. So they thought the significant predictors, which do you have? We talked about the SED rate, SED rate, disappearance of joint symptoms, and relapse after cessation. But again, the final thing in all the articles, both in this article and the ones published in America, is if you don't know, you're probably better off saying you have a rheumatic fever. You don't want to relapse from rheumatic fever because you don't want to have carditis and the significant problems associated again. But a huge, neat idea. Uh, Fifteen years ago, no one ever heard of post epicoccal reactive arthritis. Now it becomes a major factor in ped pediatric rheumatological type problems. I like eosinophilia as hematologists. We, we see lots of neat things for eosinophilia. And I just want to teach you one of the things that happens, in, in, especially in pediatrics. This is a previously healthy three-month-old, pardon me, three-year-old male. He actually presented to the emergency room, had fever and cough and wheezing. He'd never wheezed before. His exam was completely negative, except he had bilateral wheezing. He has chest x-ray, had, quote, viral-type changes, whatever that means, I'm not quite sure. But it was interesting when he did his initial CBC, he had 42% eosinophils. He wasn't on any medicine. He didn't have any other known factor to have eosinophilia. This was interesting because this child had had a CBC once in life at one year old. He had normal eosinophils. But he's a good example of now what we call visceral larva migraines. If you have any kind of dogs or rarely cats, remember just having visceral larva migraines, toxic care is not uncommon especially if you have puppies. So we went back and asked him about his history and his social history. And they, had, they said their dog had a litter of puppies about five weeks ago, and he plays with the pups, and they lick him, and they say it's every day of their life, okay? <laughs> so it wasn't hard to imagine how he picked up visceral larva migraines. Uh, puppies have it. In some studies, puppies have it up 40 and 50 percent. All you need to do is, is have the puppy poop enter your mouth, okay? <laughs> Go to your intestine. Remember, man is a dead-end host for visceral larva migraines. However, when the eggs hatch in your intestine, they go all over your body. 
Again, you can often have massive eosinophilia. Remember, eosinophils are probably in our body. If you go back, why in evolution do we have an eosinophil? One of the big things was, if you have any kind of in invasive worm, I don't care, in the whole world, you typically have eosinophils, and they thought to play a really important role uh, as an anti-parasite uh, leukocyte. But again, most important, if you have one of those worms go to your eye, you can have ocular larva migraines. And this is the big thing. In pediatrics, if you walk into the newborn nursery and you look and do a white, red reflex in some eye and it comes back white, you say, oh my God, I got retinoblastoma. If you have the same thing happen in a toddler age group, they probably have toxic care until proven otherwise, okay? But again, it's, you can send off an antibody titer. Now we have nice antibody titers. We used to have to send them to CDC. They have elevated immunoglobulins in general, IgG, IgM, IgA. And they also have elevated isohemagglutin in titers. If you get a quick diagnosis, they respond quickly to albinzidol. One of the things we'd like to ask the audience, if I was in New York City, you would probably be really tired of this disease. Say, why are you trying to teach me something? We know all about this. Why do they have, in New York City, it's probably the capital in America for having visceral larval migraines. And why is that? Well, if you live in New York City, where the, everybody lives in a big apartment building and you have dogs, you take your dogs out to walk in a, with a very small amount of grass available. If you live in a big high-rise apartment and there's no else place to play other than that small place of greenness, you play there too, your children do. So it's very easy, it's a very common disease if you live on the East Coast. If you have a small amount of grass, you have a large amount of dogs and children, it's very easy to see how they have such an increased numbers. Yeah. This is also uh, the thing I found very interesting. Uh, when you first see it, it's kind of frightening, at least it was frightening for me. This was a 17-year-old female it was in our emergency room. She had been previously absolutely normal. She didn't have anything. Was an athlete. She was a superb athlete. She had been previous. Uh, she said she wasn't on drugs. We, when teenagers tell us we're on drugs, we believe that after the drug screen comes back. Okay, uh, they had no previous psychosis. She had been normal. She had not had anything, and her physical exam was normal. However, she was doing some very strange things. Okay, that's why they call it a new Alice in Wonderland syndrome. She would look at her parents and one time say, oh my God, you're shrunk, and the next time she'd say, you're expanded, you're massive, you're like, like an elephant, okay? Uh, she thought that some days when you ask her, what day is this? She said, I don't know, because yesterday lasted two years long, okay? Also, her whole object was distorted. She'd look at a star and think it's a circle. And I knew she was ill. She looked at me and said, you're beautiful. I said, no, there's something wrong with you, okay? <laughs> we know there's something wrong with you. And this is called Alice in Wonderland Syndrome. It's a really, really kind of neat thing. You certainly have to prove all the other things that can cause one to have Alice in Wonderland syndrome. Obviously, drug intoxication is a biggie, especially in adolescence. Acute onset psychosis, some cerebral lesions, temporal epilepsy and migraine, if you believe in that. But just remember, what happens a lot of time in pediatrics is this young lady had, had mono. I mean, her EBV titers were out of sight. She had atypical lymphocytes in her blood smear and a big swollen uh, spleen. But it certainly can happen. The number one infectious organism causing Alice in the Wonderland syndrome is still EBV. Now there's been a report from Coxsackie and varicella virus. But it's an interesting thing to see because it's very frightening for someone who's been normal and all of a sudden having everyone stare at you like, what's wrong with you? Yeah. <laughs> Again, this is, next is an interesting thing too. I like to preach to people now uh, about, about you know, when you see a child and it has something unusual, you have to expand your diagnosis by where we are in the world as far as sexuality is concerned. This is a 16-year-old male. He'd been previously healthy. His band had been selected and went to Washington, D.C. They're playing a big parade. So they were gone almost a week. He came back uh, several weeks after he came back. He started being more tired and feeling ill. As we know, at least in our clinic, in the adolescent clinic, almost every adolescent you see is tired and feel, <laughs> feeling ill and sleeping more. They, when they stay up all day, they wonder why they're at night. They wonder why they're tired. We don't know why their, their primary care doctor gave them amoxicillin. Uh, that did nothing. He just, his illness continued to progress, which is nice that they gave him amoxicillin, and now they thought he had mono. It's a good thing. He wouldn't have to do any tests. He'd have this nice, wonderful rash in most cases. But he did have one of the smear increased atypical lymphocytes. His mono screen was negative. We're going to see later on he actually had EBV antibody titers, which were negative. He now had fevers, and he was more ill, and he had headaches, pharyngitis, his throat culture continued to be negative now for the second or third time, and he'd had negative EBV titers. Yeah? He was finally admitted to the hospital, uh, in the hospital service, when they didn't know what he had, and I don't know what they were going to find in the hospital, but they did find one thing. He had a few lymph nodes, a cervical, he had one epitrochlear node. 
just remember, yeah, if you're an adult and you go to your internist and he's feeling your epitrochlear nodes and he feels a nice big epitrochlear node, remember that's a very common thing in secondary syphilis. So they said, oh my, no, he didn't have it, but his, his titers, his BDRL was negative. So now I so said, we don't know what he has. He still has atypical lymphocytes, his sed rate's elevated. Remember, he was now negative and when he, by the time he left the hospital for EBV, CMV, toxo, hepatitis, and measles. That's also really important as a hematologist. Those are the things that can cause you to have atypical lymphocytes in your blood smear. So it said, now, no, he had none of those. So one of the other physicians who was on the hospital service says, we're going to test him for one other thing. And he ended up being HIV positive, okay? So just remember this mono-like syndrome, which actually mimics in many ways mono or toxoplasmosis onset even rarely CMV. You have the same thing, fevers and sweats, and you don't feel good, and pharyngitis and lymph nodes. But now it's thought, especially in, in, in adolescents and younger adults, maybe a 30 to 50% can have this illness like initially. It doesn't have to be this severe, but at least an illness that they knew they had all these things together, especially fever, lymphadenopathy, pharyngitis, and fatigue. They often also have a macular rash uh, on their palms and soles. It's not good to, to be an adolescent or young adult once we see that rash, on their, especially on their palms, we really worry about secondary syphilis. But this young man was HIV positive and now is under therapy. It just goes to show you that on his long trip, he probably played something other than his tuba. So he had to get it from somewhere. It didn't run from the toilet seat like he thought. Yeah. Another thing that's really changed medicine, I'd like to bring up some of the newer things that's happened is the hemangiomas are a very common thing in pediatrics. Children are born with nothing. They get a little red dot, and this red dot can expand and get sometimes massive inside. But again, what they found is using a beta blocker, propranolol, was simply discovered accidentally. A group of pediatric cardiologists in Canada noticed when they had children who needed propranolol, they had to, and they had also hemangiomas, the hemangiomas disappeared like that. Remember the old therapy used that prednisone, interferon, took a long time to get rid of hemangioma. There's nothing better than nature. If you want to wait to four or five years, you're going to get over hemangioma anyway. But the best results are still using the growing phase. There's a very rapid response. We, we now, in our diagnostic clinic, have our eighth child recently. We follow a very specific protocol from the University of Minnesota, and these children have all done massively well. It's non-toxic. We follow to to toxicities. There was, this is just a child from the literature. This was a child initially with a huge hemangioma with eyes. And this was a child two weeks later already significantly even able to open the eyes. So he, propranolol, which had, makes no sense. If you ask me pathophysiologically, how does propranolol make an hemangioma, a growing hemangioma in infancy go away, I could give you no answer. But it's been a marvelous, marvelous addition to these children. You know, if you have a small hemangioma someplace, it doesn't matter. You get one in your eye or one in your face or someplace that's big, you need to be very careful. You can get Kasselbach Merritt syndrome, you can have thrombocytopenia, and you can bleed. Yeah? Finally, the last thing that, it, uh, that I want to talk about is the fact that uh, as a hematologist on causes over the years, we, we've seen many children have iron deficiency anemia. People give their children a horrible diet sometimes, especially when they finish nursing, however, or anything like that. But really, it started again in Canada. They found there was a very strong association between having iron deficiency anemia not just iron, remember you have iron deficiency first, if it goes on long enough, then you get anemia. Uh, however, the effects upon your IQ and your ability to do sports is affected even before you have iron deficiency anemia. So they now found in this study a very strong association. These children with iron deficiency had strokes. <clears throat> Previously healthy, 10 times more likely. The, the postulations are wonderful. They think maybe you get, if you have iron deficiency, you have a hypercoagulable state. The other thing is most kids with, the throm with have iron deficiency anemia have thrombocytosis. Their, white, their platelet count's very high. Uh, you can, you know, the platelets are an acute phase reactant. You can have an infection and have your platelet count go up. You can have long, if you walk in today and anybody in this room and you, you, the doctor does a CBC on you happen to have isolated thrombocytosis, they're going to be really worried about you having GI bleeding. But they just still don't know in children. But it's a very big thing. We went back in our records, we have two children now, we know in the last 35 years have come in strokes had iron deficiency. So it becomes very interesting to know that and to know they're just really beginning to get to the pathophysiology, why? That's the important question here, why, yeah? I thought I'd end for something I like to do and uh, uh, that everyone seems to like. And I, we used to call these quickies and I was told that has sexual connotation so we just changed it to nooners, which uh, you know, hopefully is this. These are all children. We don't show pictures of someone who, who once in from Iowa. This young girl actually came from southern Iowa, where there's a really a paucity of pediatricians. And she had had this swollen lymph node in her neck, and it got bigger and bigger. 
uh, her, she went ahead and had a biopsy. We're going to talk about later. That's a really bad thing to do in this disease. She'd been on a variety of antibiotics. She was still draining stuff out of her tube that she had had, the drain she'd had in her neck. Uh, actually, as soon as we did saw that, we went ahead, not only did a gram stain, we did stain for acid fast. This young lady had atypical mycobacterium. Atypical mycobacterium is far more common a cause in our society here in America of cervical adenopathy than true TB. If you went to Africa, where I go every year for a mission, we see they have true TB with their cervical adenopathy. Remember, the organisms that cause these, the atypicals are everywhere, commonly in the cereal, they're very easy to pick up. But this is the worst thing that can happen. It seems like when you try to uh, at least do a needle biopsy in this area, you'd make a draining tract, which is very hard then to cure. A typical mycobacterium like TB, you can't cure one week of one simple antibiotic. They have long-term multiple antibiotics. The treatment for atypical mycobacterium, uh, uh, scrofula, is still surgical removal. You take that note out, you live happily ever after. You don't have to worry about the side effects. So you still have to remember in Iowa, we have children with scrofula. This young man that also had a very interesting this big lesion here near his ear, had been to his pediatrician who didn't know what it was, but says, looks like you might have a cellulitis. We're going to go ahead and, and give you an antibiotic. The antibiotic didn't cure his cellulitis. He went to an ENT doctor who gave him a stronger, quote, antibiotic. He still didn't well. So he came to the, our clinic and we said, that's very interesting. We did his workup. I want you to know everything again on him was completely normal. His blood count was normal. His Z rate was normal. His chemistries are normal. So what you really need to do is have a biopsy of that. And this biopsy showed that he had a chloroma. That was actually leukemic cells. Uh, about 3 to 4 percent of children, more common with AML, but some with ANL, have this initial presentation with a lesion, a, a, single, pardon me, a singular lesion uh, any place. It has a strange predilection in pediatrics for the head and neck. In adults, it can be anywhere. This is called a chloroma. Uh, and it's not, and so this child, even though he had a normal blood count, is another good example of ALL and emphasis. When he has bone marrow, it was packed with leukemic cells, but he certainly presented initially with this chloroma on his head. This is another good example. This is a child who has his primary herpetic gingival stomatitis. We see lots of kids who have their initial infection. Remember, when you have recurrence, uh, no one in Iowa ever has recurrence of the herpes. They always have cold sores, okay? It's really important to, uh, the, especially the older females have cold sores, so they don't have herpes recurrent. But what happens when you have the primary herpes infection, you get this severe gingival stomatitis. Most of these children have to be admitted they can't eat, they don't want to eat, they can't eat, there's too much pain. This child also had secondary infection. He had, you can just see the nice uh, lesions in, involved. He had both staph and strep that grow from there, so it's not uncommon when you break down your skin, especially in your nasal area, to have that. So this is what happens when you get the initial primary infection with herpes. It's typically type 1. We see some unfortunate children where the initial presentation is in the eye, which becomes very severe at times, and you worry about their eyesight. But what's interesting about this disease, not only the disease itself, why is it so severe the initially, but we see that at the end of the year, at the end of December, and the first of January, the vast majority of kids who are going to have primary herpetic gingival stomatitis. Why is there such a seasonal influence in this particular disease? Neither. Who, who comes over the holidays if Aunt Martha comes from Arkansas to see the new baby over the holidays? What's she going to do to that new baby? She's going to kiss it, hug it. And remember, she doesn't have herpes, ladies. She just has a cold sore. <laughs> And then you give your poor grandchild or poor, poor friend's child a primary herpetic gingival stomatitis. Remember, where you have your initial breakout is where you're going to have them the rest of your life. The worst thing in the world is to have your initial breakout in your eye or someplace else. Yeah. This is something else we see I think is a perfect example. The British have a nice term for this. They call it night bottle carry syndrome. This is what happens when you get uh, two and three and four years old and still have your bottle at night. It rots out all your teeth. <laughs> uh, and so certain so night bottles carry syndrome is a really significant thing. And so it's very hard when, when most of your teeth that you have in your, in your whole uh, uh, mouth or that. And so if you want to do that to your child or grandchild, let them take the bottle for a long period of time after they're born. This is also a young, uh, she was a 16 year old. I knew her very personal. Her initial history began when she was 14 and she was diagnosed with having Hodgkin's disease, stage two. Back when she was, this was long enough back when you first got chemotherapy then, it was really difficult. We didn't have the wonderful antiemetics and everything we have now. She got one cycle of MOP therapy and said, I'm never doing anything again. And she's never got lymphoma again either. I don't know how, I don't know how she never got Hodgkin's disease again, but she hasn't. But now she came in and she had this severe pharyngitis. 
Look at Yuvati, a bright red. She had to exudate uh, if she was really in pain. So we said, okay, we go over the same kind of differential diagnosis. Did she have strep? No. Did she have mono? No. Did she have toxin? No. Did she have CMV? No. Uh, and then finally we said, what, what do you do for entertainment? And she, only at age 16, she liked to go out to truck stop and entertain truckers, and she had gone to cockle pharyngitis, so you can't look. And so, especially in adolescents and young adults, you always have to consider gone to cockle pharyngitis along with a di other differential diagnosis, yeah? This is just, and I'm going to show you what hemangiomas, this was taken long enough back that we didn't have propranolol therapy then. She'd already uh, failed to, to respond to steroids, which used to be the treatment she had failed to interfere on. This is the kind of thing now that you can put on propranolol and get rid of very rapidly. Yeah. And finally, this is the last one. This young, uh, next to the last one, this young child had this tuft of hair, which was completely different than anything else on his head. And I just want to remind you, when you see those, you really have to worry because that's often a sinus tract that goes right into the brain. It's not uncommon then for them to get meningitis. This is a very disturbing sign to see in a newborn. Yeah. And f this was another one. This young lady came to the emergency room with her grandmother, and her grandmother said she had insect bites. And I said, hmm, insect bites, it seems... No, she didn't have an insect, unless you want to call a camel an insect. Uh, she was actually just had a burn, who just put a cigarette on her, and she'd had multiple other healed areas. So uh, this, uh, you don't want to believe, is a bite. And Finally, this was one of the child that, that I'd like to say, I, I think I know a lot, and sometimes I feel I know nothing. But this was a child one of my partners had had in the clinic, and this child just had fever for two or three days and lethargy. They say, come, I said, I want you to look at this child. And I said, well, what do I want to do? That? She says, well, she says, I did a capillary refill and it's three minutes and it hasn't gotten better. I said, oh, you're kidding me. <laughs> uh, and that's true. Yeah, I put my thumbprint on there and I could stare at it and stare at it and stare at it. Uh, and again, it would just stay there. And I said, oh, my God, I've been always taught if your capillary refill is long, you've got something problem bad. Uh, we watched this child in the clinic for two or three hours and never did anything. We was put in the hospital one night and never did anything. But I still don't know how to explain how the capillary refill was so poor. Uh, and why just, uh, by the next day it was better. But I like this because I like things I can't explain. That's what I'd like to end is if there's any question. I really appreciate giving you these interesting cases. It shows you, where, you know, there's lots of interesting things around. It's easy when you know what it is. It's hard sometimes you've never seen them before. <laughs> yes. Uh, so back to the uh, strep throat that isn't a positive strep screen. Yeah. Uh, do, does anybody culture for yeah, the Yeah, uh, you can call, they do now. now. You have to ask your laboratory to do specific. It's not even a difficult thing to do. They'd have to use the, like, growing anything, gonococcus or anything unusual, you have to use the right uh, media. Yeah? But it's a very, read the literature, Google out, you'll see, my God, it's becoming now the accepted the paradigm. Why is it interesting about disease? Why doesn't it start to adolescence, and why does it end before, about age 25? Makes it very interesting. But in the past, we would have said, well, you have a virus now. I said, no, I don't believe that anymore. When I saw my own grandson and the culture is positive, you had fuse of bacterium, yeah. So then maybe wait for the 48 hours for the culture? I, I don't think I'd wait. They're, they're mo you, you'll find about them, they're ill. And I said, I find penicillin to be so innocuous. There are so few organisms in your body that since the plain old penicillin, pin VK now, that to put them on for several days while you're waiting to culture, it's one of the few times in life I'd say, do it. I would not wait, yeah. How completely yeah. do the uh, hemangiomas disappear, and uh, is is there a time period after which uh, the propranolol is not effective? Yes, in it has to be. In, that's two very interesting questions. Yes, the answer to the second thing first is they have to be in a growing phase. So typically, they say between a year and a year and a half, probably not going to work, and that's been everyone's experience. Uh, but do they disappear? They disappear completely. We had the happiest, happiest parents who will come in with a huge hemangioma in the eye or jaw or mouth or someplace, and four to six weeks later be almost gone, and two months later gone. So it's unbelievable rapid response for yet unknown reasons. Yeah? And actually now all of our recent referrals have come from vascular surgeons. People send it to them, they say, no, we go to the diagnostic clinic. And I said, we're very careful. We follow a very strict protocol from the University of Minnesota, and we do not deviate from it. Yeah? How did somebody stumble on using propanolol for that. <laughs> I told you it was pediatric cardiologists in Canada, and they just happened, they see they have a huge number of patients at, in Toronto. And they, one, two of the doctors there just happened to notice that the child had hemangiomas at the same time they were treating for their underlying cardiac condition, the hemangiomas disappeared more rapidly. So they had, from that, they went ahead and had the first clinical trial, and it works, and it works unbelievably well. Yeah. If you, could fit, if you could figure it out why, you let me know and we'll publish it together. <laughs>
Thank you very much. I really appreciate coming here to do this.